What does filmed for IMAX mean? It isn't just a movie that'll look great on IMAX's screens. It means that hiding from a sandstorm feels like fear in every flicker. And every triumph is felt in every sound wave. And the things we've only imagined, you can truly experience those too. That's what filmed for IMAX means. Get tickets to experience Dune Part 2 now and IMAX's exclusive expanded aspect ratio. Age of Radio. Coming up. Hey, balls of Montezuma. Yo, you, shores of Tripoli. Huh. Step over here and meet Tarawa and say hello to Iwo Jima. All this and America's favorite racist this week on For Screen and Country. My name is Stryker, Sergeant John M. Stryker. You're gonna be my squad, a rifle squad. Three of us have seen action. Corporal Dunn, Charlie Bass, and myself. You're gonna learn from us. In boot camp, you learned out of a book. Out here, you gotta remember the book and learn a thousand things that have never been printed, probably never will be. You gotta learn right and you gotta learn fast. And any man that doesn't wanna cooperate I'll make him wish he hadn't been born. Before I'm through with you, you're gonna move like one man and think like one man. If you don't, you'll be dead. You guys have had a nice, easy day. I hope you enjoyed it. Because it's the last one you're gonna get for a long time. You joined the Marines because you wanted to fight. Well, you're gonna get your chance. And I'm here to see that you know how. If I can't teach you one way, I'll teach you another. But I'm gonna get the job done. The skipper of this outfit is Captain Joyce. Platoon leader is Lieutenant Baker. Platoon sergeant, Sergeant Wright. Any questions? No, Sergeant Stryker, there are no questions. Other than to say, which is not a question, it's a statement. It's a welcome, really. A welcome to all of our listeners out there across the world. Yes, this is a podcast called For Screening Country, and we are coming to you, as usual, live, this time from atop Mount Suribachi on the Isle of Iwo Jima where some 80 years ago, brave Marines attacked the Japanese emplacements, sacrificed much blood and treasure to um, capture this large rock. Treasure? Treasure. Much treasure, much blood. Jason, what are we doing recording a podcast? We need to find the treasure. Well, uh, after we're done the podcast, we can certainly go out and look for some treasure. I feel like it may be against international law as a sort of, um, as this is sort of a graveyard, really, for a lot of soldiers. But mm. uh, if you want to go looking for some gold teeth, I'm down. I mean, you know me. I'm always looking for gold teeth, gold doubloons, gold mm-hmm. pantaloons, gold fruit of the looms, gold fruit loops. Gold yeah. uh, poop scoops, absolutely. And and if there's one thing I've I can say about you, Brendan Wall, is that you love gold. I'm kind of like it. I'm kind of like uh, that scene in Forrest Gump when he just talks about all the shrimp that he can make, but yeah, with gold. Except it's gold. Yeah, yeah. Gold sandwich, yeah. gold fillings, mm-hmm. gold edible gold. Just just gold in general. Just gold. Just lumps of gold, bars of gold, chunks of gold. Mm, cash for gold. Cash for gold. Jason, you said it's a podcast. You said it's the na- you said the name of the podcast. You're Jason. I'm Brendan. How's it going? Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's going great. It's going great. We're we're here. We're like I say, we're to- atop Mount Suribachi on the Isle of Iwo Jima. It's a bit windy up here, but we have fantastic mics, so you can barely hear it. Mm. Um, Woo! Oh, it's coming in mine a little bit. I think that might have been the ghost of John Wayne. Oh no! Well, he sounded <laughs> he sounded pretty uh, sounded pretty feminine. If you ask me, now wait a wait a second, there, Pilgrim. Jimmy, what are you doing, letting John Wayne in here? The ghost of John Wayne. What 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 are you doing here, Wayne? Get get your ass out of here. Hey, Jimmy, we have a special connection, you and me. We both did the Liberty Vance movie. 
Well, yeah, we did, and and and, and, and I tell you, I, I wasn't real fond of my time on the set with you. Wow. I didn't like how you kept pinching my bottom and calling me a fairy girl. Well, I only calls them like I sees them, Jimmy. Do you mind if I do my tight five on homosexuals? No, no, you gotta get out of here and get back to racist hell. Ah. Get there, just go, get on out of here. Ah. Sorry, fellas. Uh, I, I, I always try to keep John Wayne out of here, and it's the first time he slipped up, I think. I don't know. My memory's not so good. It's okay, Jimmy. And you know, John Wayne, known for his stand-up, I don't need to hear it, though. It's, it's, I'm glad we quelled that pretty quickly. It was, uh, it was, it was dated in 1951, uh, so I, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, it really was. Thanks. Used, a, used a lot of words they don't even put in dictionaries anymore. All right, I'm going back to the door now. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, we're, we are here to talk about a movie, Brendan, because as our listeners may or may not know, if this is your first episode, let's tell you what we do here. We watch, right now, we watch war movies, and we are watching Paste Magazine's list of the top 100 war movies of all time and various other assorted war movies that we feel are relevant to our interests. Brendan? Now, these are all North American, right? Because you know me, I don't like other languages or cultures. Mm. Mm, no, well, actually, you'll find that so far we've actually watched a couple of movies that uh, are not in the uh, the King's English. Damn it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But uh, that is not uh, that is not a setup for this week's film, because we are going to talk about, for the first time on this podcast, Jason, we've referenced him many times. We've talked about him on my other podcast, but we have not had him make an appearance on here yet somehow i expected i thought he was going to be in all the british movies but it was not to be but ladies and gentlemen we are talking about this week the john wayne war film sands of iwo jima oh and john wayne performed the theme song that's odd i'm just gonna hit play right here look around pilgrims look around there's Germans and Japanese and mounds, bars. World War Two, brought to you by Mounds Bar. <laughs> Wait, that, and, that, and that was specific to this movie. Yeah, they had a deal with Mounds. He uh, really sold out bars. for that theme song. <laughs> He did. I, I thought it was bold of the Mounds Candy Bar Company to sponsor the entire war. Uh, a lot of companies wouldn't touch it, and they still went for it. So uh, my salute to them. Mm. Well, they went so far as to sponsor the gas used during the war. Uh, they said, you know, it'll just be it'll just be w uh, wafts of Mounds smells, which I thought was a, a weird way to propagandize uh, the men into war. Yeah, yeah, it was. Mm hmm. Also, I appreciate that uh, somebody went into that song in post and added unease to make sure he was saying Japanese and not what he probably actually said in the song. So that was nice. Yeah, they had to, you know, they, they, it was a different time. <laughs> um, well, yeah, Sands of Iwo Jima. Um, funny enough, not the only movie with the title Iwo Jima that we will talk about on this podcast. That'll come up again one more time. It's a pretty important. It's a pretty important rock in the Pacific. But it's just funny that it will. It it won't just come up as a subject matter, but it will literally be in the title again. Yep. <laughs> another, oh, yeah. another episode, a, f a far more well known movie, I think. But anyway, we are talking about uh, Sands of Iwo Jima. This is directed by Mr. Alan Dwan, and uh, we haven't talked about Alan Dwan before. He hasn't done like a lot of big movies. He did a lot of silent films, a lot of silent uh, dramas, but. I guess his uh, his his biggest one was probably Robin Hood with Douglas Fairbanks, and he also did a movie called Silver Load, which I'm assuming is about old people getting off. Uh, yeah, I can I only mean, it assume. Has to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Palance and Charles Bronson in That's, Silver Load. I don't know about that, Jason, because that was in like, the 40s, I think, and they would both be oh. little children. So I don't think I, I like that. Yeah, they'd be, <laughs> had to be, be like old in the 40s. <laughs> like, like John, Walter Brennan. <laughs> Walter Brennan and Walter Houston at it again in yeah. Silver Load. <laughs> uh, yeah, whoa, look, look, it's all, it's all sparkling like a silver vein. Whoa, that's ropier than my lasso. <laughs> um, so, yeah, 
Alan Dwan. Um, starring in this movie, of course, we have John Wayne starring as... Best known, of course, for, for The Conqueror, where he played Genghis Khan. Yes, his most famous role. The, the, reason, every, the reason people love him is uh, his mm-hmm. portrayal of Genghis Khan in The Conqueror. Uh, John Wayne uh, plays a character named John. Come on, John. Uh, John Stryker, General Stryker. Sergeant Stryker, sorry. Um, we also have John Agar as uh, PFC Conway. Who is uh, mm-hmm. I would I would actually yeah I would say he's like the second lead he's a pretty important character. We have um, a female character with lines. What Adele yeah. Mara as Allison Bromley was the, the the lady that he marries very quickly. I noted that there was a surprising amount of ladies in this movie for a war movie. Yeah, there's a, there's at least two or three. Um, I know with lines. There are many that just stare while the other while the sure. guys talk, <laughs> but there are a couple uh, with yeah, lines. Well, yeah, because. Because, you know, they have the dance hall scenes where they're on Liberty and they go to the bar and there's all the ladies there well, me, and it's just it's time to dance me, and rub up on each let other. Let me get through the cast before you start. That's the okay, whole plot, right, right. Jason. We don't want to go through that. <laughs> um, we got Forrest Tucker as PFC Thomas. We've got Wally Cassell as PFC Rigazzi. I have many notes on him. We have James Brown, not the singer, as PFC Charlie Bass. Richard Webb as Dan Shipley, PFC Dan Shipley, and Arthur Franz as Corporal Dunn slash narrator. Jason, this movie, Sands of Iwo Jima, I had never, ever, 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 ever heard of it. Had, oh. had any, any knowledge of this going into this for you? I knew it existed, and I generally thought of it as like a dad war movie. Like it's the mm. sort of war movie that dads would talk about. If like my, my dad wasn't into war movies, but if my dad was into war movies, I'm sure he'd be like, "Oh, you gotta check out Sands of Iwo Jima." Right. Your dad was into John Wayne. Your your dad is more into uh, snuff films, right? Uh, n- no, no. Uh, uh, t- keep my father's name out your mouth. I didn't mean it. Uh, as, I'm not judging. <laughs> No, he's more. He he likes horse racing. Horse racing. And it's not. And it's not because he has a gambling problem. So, it's because he he races horses. So he's into. Uh, he so his favorite movie is like they shoot horses, don't they? Yeah. Which no, for a sure. movie not about horses at all. <laughs> Actually, my my dad watches the most dad ass TV show. He loves Yellowstone, like so oh, many other. Dads. Of course, every dad, every yeah. mom, moms too. Yeah. Yeah. Wives, well, absolutely. Lots of people love love Yellowstone. Jason, I used to work in an office that, where I was the only male, and let me tell you, I was the only one without anything to talk about when it came to Yellowstone conversation. Wow! Everybody, wow. everybody else, all all these other all these other you know uh, middle aged ladies talking about Yellowstone, and I'm like, you know what? I, I you guys are you guys are great. I have nothing to add to this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> what am I gonna say? Hmm. Mm. I'm like, ooh, Kevin Costner, you guys must be familiar with Waterworld. <laughs> and then they stare at me blankly. <laughs> you guys want to watch The Postman? I've got it on VHS. I've got the extended cut. He only played at That's parties. Right. <laughs> it was only released in European theaters for one day. <laughs> and it was one theater, and it was Kevin Costner's basement <laughs> that he rented in Lisbon. So that has nothing to do with uh, our movie. We're talking about Sansa no. Jima. We're talking about a war movie. We're talking about we're going to World War II, Jason, as we do many times on this show. Sorry, folks. World War II is in a lot of war movies. It's the vast majority of them. It's a big one. But, Jason, tell, tell us tell us a little bit about this about this thing. So this is this is a pretty, what you I would consider a pretty standard war movie in that this is about... Guys, they're coming in, they're, they're joined the Marines. I don't know if they were drafted. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but they're in the Marines. And uh, they got to get trained. And who trains them but Sergeant John Stryker, our old pal John Wayne, mm-hmm. America's favorite racist. As, as uh, the intro man said it. As the intro man said it. Now, John Wayne is a character, uh, rather, the I should say Stryker, You're, not you, so much John you, Wayne. You gosh darn right, John Wayne was a character. John Wayne was a character. John Wayne, however, did not serve in the army in World War II, and he spent much of his life trying to make up for that fact by uh, uh, being as jingoistic as shit on screen when he was playing military roles. I, Jason, I don't think I think I think you're not giving him enough credit. I think jingoistic on screen and in real life. Sure. Yeah. No question. <laughs> um, but here he plays Stryker. Now Stryker is uh, again. This is like one of those characters that i think helped lay a lot of pipe for future movies um and it's a character that is kind of a reminds me of of the sergeant from uh the steel helmet what was his name sergeant uh i know who you're talking about yes it does remind me of him a little bit 
where but he's kind of the different side of the coin where he's a a grizzled guy who's been through shit and it's clear he's been through shit like John Wayne's character is much more of like a caricature of yeah. of that guy like he's a he you know he's this experienced sergeant and we and and you know he knows how to train people he's a hard ass but he's doing it because he has to be a hard ass if his boys are going to survive you know and he can't show them any sort of like weakness <laughs> or like love and i see why you forgot the name because his name was sergeant zach not a super memorable gruff no. sergeant name <laughs> not quite like sergeant striker in this movie or the we'll, we'll later see sergeant steiner mm. in uh, cross of iron yes coming soon maybe i don't know but jason i want to say right off the bat because you said okay he's kind of like that gene evans character but like on the other side of it and as a caricature i will say right away he was not as unrealistically mean or tyrannical as I expected he would be. No, he's like he's like the the sergeant in um, All Quiet in the Western Front, where the men hate him. They think he's like so hard ass. He doesn't really seem like he's that hard ass. Like he's not. He doesn't seem like he's doing anything that any army sergeant wouldn't do. Like all of. The- I, I mean, I know he, he he hits that guy in the face with a rifle butt and tries to beat up Conway, but. You know, uh, some people are weird. Well, I mean, I think... It, well, no, it's not Conway he beats up. Are you talking about the guy later on in the movie? Isn't it Conway he takes out to the woods and gives him... A, oh, no, it's not Conway. It's Thomas, because Thomas yeah, was the guy Thomas who went for the coffee the, break. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Forrest Tucker. Um, but no, it, like, most of the stuff that he does in this movie, most of the way he acts and most of the things he says, it seems fairly reasonable. Like, it seems like, it seems like he's mostly, like... All of these things you can tell are done because he doesn't. If he if someone else fucks up, you could take you could risk someone else's life. That seems to yeah. be his like priority number one goal. I mean, and as we heard in the opening speech, uh, which I heard the opening speech, the opening speech of the show, a speech from the movie where he's like, "You gotta, you, you know, you didn't learn all of it in boot camp. You learned what you could, and now you got to learn in the field. You got to learn it right, and you got to learn it fast." Hmm. Yeah. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but that's yeah, that's what he's dealing with, and yeah. and that doesn't, and that's not crazy. Like he doesn't. I, I mean, now we know this was an early film after World War II. This is only four years after the war ended. Yeah, this must have been just after Battleground because Battleground was like yeah. the first World War II movie released after World War II. So this must have been like just yeah. later that year. Yeah, and um, it definitely made a crowd pleaser. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's it it hits all the um all the usual, you know, all the all the usual tropes of this kind of movie that you want to hit. Like and and it's a movie that it strikes me in the way that, you know, people often say that Jaws is the first blockbuster. Well, then I would say this is like a proto blockbuster of some mm. sort. Like cuz it 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 is a it's a crowd-pleasing action movie version of War starring a guy who in this specific role is quite good. Um and charismatic and he's got enough supporting interesting supporting actors around him that can pick up whatever slack he has well that's the thing this is it it's hard it, it's it's hard jason it's hard to go back when you watch an older movie sometimes your brain doesn't your brain makes the disconnect of like oh man this is so familiar oh it's been done and really you should yeah. you got you got to put yourself in that time and like no in 1949 this this wasn't has been done a bunch no. of times this no. was like fairly fresh at the time with the reason we see it as that is just because we've seen it so much since then i mean it's it's my my go-to example and i've probably said it here before many times but it's always casablanca when you watch the last scene of casablanca and he's doing that speech where he's like you know if you get on that plane you're gonna regret it maybe not today maybe not tomorrow but you listen to that whole scene every single line in that scene you've heard somewhere else it has been referenced and referenced and referenced and you'll think it's like the most cliched thing but it's not because it was the thing that made the cliche it was the originator and it's fantastic so folks if you learn nothing else from today's podcast please watch casablanca available from warner brothers entertainment 1941 uh, you'll probably have to search it out on DVD because chances are they've written it off for a tax break. But spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah, Warner Brothers. They're like, we're going to cancel Batgirl and Casablanca. <laughs> yep. yep. No, we're getting rid of Casablanca altogether. We don't want to pay residuals to Bogey's family. Yeah. But spoiler alert. Um, you may hear about that movie in more detail from us. <laughs> 
I like how I, I make it such like a, a, a aloof kind of clue. It's like, th- that means you're doing the movie. Like it's, it's yeah, pretty probably going to watch it at some point. Obvious <laughs> from my description. It, look, I'm happy for an excuse to watch Casablanca again. Mm-hmm. But this, Brendan, is not Casablanca. No. It's a good movie, but it's not Casablanca. Oh, I thought you were going to say, say this is, I thought you were going to say, this is not Casablanca. This is a good movie. <laughs> we got something with some real <sighs> meat to it. I don't it's like, like man, that don't... bullshit Casablanca. Yeah, leave the people hanging on that note till we get to Casablanca. That would be, yeah. be wild. <laughs> <laughs> Jason's least favorite movies, Casablanca and Godfather Part Two. <laughs> so we got less... Less family stuff, I would say. Mm. Not that there was much family stuff in um, something like Hacksaw Ridge, but it's a little bit like Hacksaw Ridge, where it's like he goes into training. These guys all go into training. They get a little bit of training done. We get you know an hour into the movie, and we get we finally get to see some combat, and we see the invasion of Tarawa, and the boys taking the beach there. And then eighty two minutes into the movie, we get to Iwo Jima. But it's uh, so it's watching them as they proceed through these two invasions, but and then seeing their relationship develop with. Um, Striker. We learn a little bit about Striker's background. Again, stock character stuff, but this was early on. So, mm-hmm. you know, he's he's an alcoholic. He likes to drink his face off, which really doesn't figure into the movie all that much. Like, he never does, and maybe this is because John Wayne was John Wayne, but he never does anything that's particularly egregious when he's drunk. Well, like, no, but they, they do they, have They come to... across him, and he's drunk in front of his subordinates, which I guess is pretty shitty. They, but... they do have to kind of save him in that moment, though, remember? Because they have they some do. patrol people coming around, and they're ha- they have to pretend that he's like he's perfectly fine. And <laughs> I, I like that moment, too, because the uh, it's like, what are we bothering? We don't like this guy. We can't leave him. And the guy goes, look, I don't care if he cut my mother's throat five minutes ago. I'm not leaving him for the shore patrol. Yeah, that, the, they hate the whatever shore he calls patrol. Them, the swabbies. Even. I'm not giving him to the swabbies because they're Marines, right? So they're kind of under the auspices of naval justice. So it's the, the Navy MPs, the, the shore patrol. We're seeing some real civil war in this movie. Years before Alex Garland, A24. <laughs> Didn't expect my type five on the A24's movie that hasn't come out yet, did you? You know, when we, when, you know, back back in the day when we talked about Civil War, we meant Iron Man versus Spider Man. We didn't mean, <laughs> sorry, Iron Man versus Captain America. How dare you say that to me of all people? <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and Jason, as you know, Spider Man helped Iron Man in that movie. Come on. Oh, he did. Oh, what a bootlicker. Oh, I mean, he gave him his fucking suit. I mean, you gotta help. You gotta you gotta know where your bread is buttered. Captain America, man, he's all about freedom. Freedom. Anywho, <laughs> um, and you know what? That's another movie, Civil War, A24. I think we might have to talk about that one when it comes out. Oh, that might be we fun. definitely have to talk about yeah. it. It's got war in the title. We have to talk about it. Yeah, Jesse Plemons, we coming for you. Nice guy. Um, So back to this movie. <laughs> so, yes, they do take a while to get to Iwo Jima. We actually even get, like, the famous pose, that statue. We do, yeah. Yeah, which is historically dubious well no i mean it, it that did happen and there's a picture of it that was the second flag raising because the first one for whatever reason i don't know if the flag fell down or if they wanted to just do it in a different place but uh no that did happen um it's just that we'll talk about it when we get there um but we'll go back a bit so yeah striker he's got the unit he's so striker he's an alcoholic he's recently i guess I don't know if he's divorced, but his wife left him with their with their son. Yeah, he's estranged from his son. We know that much. Yeah, he's estranged. Yeah, because he's you know he's in the army. He's, uh, I get the feeling too that because he's been up and down in the ranks. He's a guy that's been in the army you know since before the war. Like he apparently was a master sergeant at one point, got, but got busted down, and clearly it was because of his drinking. Yeah. But again, this drinking doesn't really figure into the plot at all. It's just it's almost like it's a character thing, and it's an excuse for them to have to save him at that point from the shore patrol. Um, I mean, I'm assuming it's because John Wayne was legitimately drunk, and they had to work. They had to write it into the movie. Could have been. I mean, he if if he was drunk, he he's pretty good. There were reports <laughs> delivering dialogue while drunk. Well, I don't know about drunk, but there were apparently reports from the movie that um they would go out with with John Wayne and party the night before, and get really really loaded, and then most of the cast would show up to the set on the next day just fucking like exhausted and fucked up and yeah. not wanting to work, and John Wayne was just like do 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 do. Speed guy must have loved speed. I think he was just. I think he just his immune system was used to it. 
It could be. He could be. I mean, and that I don't think that that was crazy for that time in Hollywood. The mm. idea of going out and getting fucked up and then just showing up for work the next day probably still happens. He hadn't done his dream role of Genghis Khan yet. No, it was still many years away, and he was chopping at the bit. I'm sure. Um, so yeah, the invasion of Tarawa, where they first get blooded, where they first get uh, uh, their bit there. Um, that's a good scene. Actually, what we should probably should talk about first before we get to Tarawa is a few more of the characters. Like we got because we, we mentioned John Wayne, we also mentioned Conway, who's a character that doesn't like John Wayne's character, doesn't like Stryker because Stryker knew his dad. His dad was a military hard ass like Stryker. Stryker, in fact, described this kid's father as the finest man I've ever served under. And and yeah, and also Conway, I think he sees Stryker. I think he sees too much of his dad in Stryker, and it's freaking him out. Like it's like. Like you said, Stryker says, yeah, your dad was the finest, blah, blah, blah. And Conway's like, oh, that makes sense because I don't like you. And I didn't really get along with my father. And he thought I was a piece of shit, um, yeah. which I don't think. I, I, I mean, I think we're led to believe that that's not what his father thought. He just he was just very poor at showing his true emotions. And even though like, at one point Conway even says to him when he's going to have a kid, he's talking about like, he's like, no, I don't want my kid to be like a fighter and like a, a big bully or a, you know, a monster. I want him to be in in intellectual and I want him to yeah. learn about Shakespeare and stuff. And to the movie's credit, they don't discredit him for saying that. There's never a moment no. where they're like, whoa, what a fairy boy. want to read about Shakespeare. No, the the closest is John Wayne going, "Well, are you throwing your intellect around." Yeah, but but like, I was surprised there was nothing like uh, John Wayne being like, "Well, that's a waste of time. The bard can suck on these nuts." No, and and that shows in later when we we see the letter that John Wayne wrote to his son. He talks about like you know that he's been a failure in many ways mm -hmm. uh, in his life. Like he understands that, but but. To, back to Conaway for a sec. Yeah. I, I kept expecting a moment where th where John Wayne was going to be like, because he keeps going, oh, I know what you, my father would tell you that I'm a failure and I'm a loser and then I'm nothing. And then you, you you know I was expecting John Wayne to be like, well, I knew your dad pretty well and he thought you were a pretty good kid, but no, we never get that. And and that makes sense to me given John Wayne's character. Uh, we specifically see that kind of called back later when the men had, have done well after battle. They did good. They held out, you know, so they lost some people and he gets his buddy, uh, his private, who's his friend. Apparently he gets him to go give the guys some sake that he had brought with him, mm -hmm. but to tell them that he pulled it off a, a dead Japanese soldier and not that it was from him. Cause God forbid they think that he like, has any regard for them or likes them that might impede his authority you know <laughs> well, and, and he couldn't tell that he could certainly couldn't tell this kid that his dad was proud of him he wouldn't want to <laughs> undersell his, his dead father well i mean we also kind of didn't we also kind of discuss this when we talked about 12 o'clock high too when we, we talked about the the brass not wanting certain people in charge and not, not wanting certain amount of fraternizing and gregory peck coming mm -hmm. in and being like no you can't be friends with them you can't do this you got to absolutely be stern and yep. stiff and and then him i guess the conclusion of that one was him finding a sort of middle ground um that yeah. worked for both of them but striker doesn't and striker no you know what actually he kind of does that he kind of comes to a little bit of a middle ground he doesn't stay the same way the whole way through he does soften a bit yeah. by the end of the film and maybe it's even in just really the last couple scenes that he kind of like when he's sitting there and he gives his immortal line i'm feeling better than i've ever felt <laughs> yeah his his flesh softens that's for sure yeah we'll oh, talk yeah. about no, that very very supple um <laughs> no their relationship is, is very interesting and i think um I think what's interesting is like he doesn't do this with any of the other guys but i always felt like he was hesitant to exert his power over Conway. Like, just, just kind of, like, tell him to do things. Like, he would give him orders, but he never felt mm. like... To me, they felt more... It felt like G Stryker was genuinely trying to be friends with him rather than trying to be his commanding officer. And I'm wondering if that's, like, the whole connection to, like, where he said, you know, I served with your father. Your father was one of the finest. He, so it's he has this built-in respect that he's like, well, if, I tr if, I, if yeah. your father was my commanding officer... I can't find it within myself to treat his kid like a piece of shit, no matter how yeah. shitty he might be being to me. Because Conway is kind of shitty to Stryker, too. Just saying. Hey, I feel like Stryker's the kind of guy that believes in genes and blood, and I bet you there's part of him that's like, well, if his old man was a good soldier, I could turn this kid into the best soldier. Now, now Jason, you say genes and blood. Now, what about, uh, what about tights? Tights and no. sweat. No? 
No, that's save that for the Shakespeare stage. Just, no, this is jeans and just blood. jeans. Now blue jeans with holes in them. Uh, I mean, jeans can be any color. They just wow. have to be denim. Jason, that was the most lovely open thing you've ever said in this podcast. Jeans can be any color, and then you ruined it by saying as long as they're denim. Look, you can be any color as long as you're a human. That's not a controversial I statement. You say you could be any color as long as you're denim. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not made of denim, don't look at me in the eyes. It's like Henry Ford once said, you could be any color as long as it's white. Oh, I was going to say that you're about to say, just like Henry Ford <laughs> said, I was, I, I knew that was not going to go well. Just like Henry Ford once remarked about the international Jew. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> if I could join World War II, I'd fight for the other side. I believe that's the quote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think Henry would have been happier making tanks for the Nazis, but thankfully he didn't because I don't know if he was even still alive by World War II. We can only hope that he was dead. Mm. Dead and dumb. Um, yeah, so that so this relationship really drives the movie, you'd say, right? Yes, that's the main one. But we've got a few other characters, too, that figure in because we've got <laughs> what is it, Thomas, right? Yeah. That's his name? Thomas, who Thomas deserves is- his beating. I'm sorry. I'm just going to say it. Yeah, he did fuck up. Uh, but Bad. Thomas, who is a guy that is, he's been in the army, I think, a little longer than the other guys because he knows Stryker. Because he even says at one point, he goes, of all the sergeants in this huge army, I had to get stuck with Stryker again. Mm. And again, he clearly doesn't like him. Well, again, though, they're hyping him up so much that when he shows up and he's not completely unreasonable, I'm like, what are you worried about? Just do your fucking job. He's nowhere near, like, early Ermie in Full Metal Jacket. Like, and he's not, like... That's... Yeah, no, absolutely not. And he's not... He's not even... He's not that fucking lunatic in um, Attack. Like, he's not that guy either. Like, yeah. he's... He, he's... He seems a little strict. Like, the guy, when he, he leans his rifle up against a tree and it falls, and he's like, okay, for that, you're sleeping with your rifle. Which is, like... You're gonna sleep with your rifle, because in this company, we don't drop our rifles. Well, he's, Pilgrim. like, you know, he's teaching him not to be careless. And it's like, okay, maybe that's, like, the one time. And maybe when he hits that guy in the face with his gun, that's a little... That's a little uh, out of line. And they even mentioned but, it in the but movie. But it does teach that guy a lesson. But I wrote down in my notes, oh, were they just allowed to do this in 1949? And then in the movie, they were like, oh, he'll get off without a warning. He'll probably get a, he'll probably get a citation. He'll get a medal, yeah. yeah. Well, because when, uh, when he takes Tom, Tom, uh, Thomas. Thomas out to the woods to beat him up, he gets interrupted by a major who's like, look, it's against the rules to uh, beat up a, a subordinate. <laughs> and that's what Thomas has to cover for him. Be like, oh, no, you just showed me some judo. That that arc is, is another really interesting thing. So we should probably explain why Thomas is getting the shit kicked out of him. Because Thomas and a couple of other guys are in, a, are in a trench, right? And they basically run out of ammo. And mm-hmm. Thomas is like, well, okay, I'll go run over and get some more ammo, and I'll come right back. He runs over, and then he stops, and he's like, is that coffee you're brewing? Stops and has himself a cup of joe. And by the time he comes I, back, his guys are dead. Or, well, one, one of them's dead and one's injured. Yeah, well, one of, he he indirectly caused the death of one of his guys. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's one of the most relatable scenes in this movie to me because I know if I was in his position and I walked by and it had been weeks since I'd had a cup of real coffee and I smelled that coffee, I'd stop for a cup of coffee too. Now, I don't know that I would have sat around for 40 minutes drinking coffee, but I would have definitely had a cup. He does, I might even have taken it with me. Yeah, I was gonna say, maybe just take it on the road. He does get very comfortable. Yeah. And it just, I just, and, it, yeah. I mean, the best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. And in the middle of battle, the best part is having a cup of um, Maxwell. But I would say the worst part, I would say uh, to his compadres, the worst part of waking up is a bayonet in your gut. Yeah, no, that's that's fair. That's That's the other, that's the Folgers commercial you didn't see. It's not your daddy's Folgers commercial. That was only for the troops. It was on posters around the, around the camp. Yes. So I guess the point was, it's like the worst part of waking up is a bayonet in your gut. So don't sleep. Drink coffee. Don't sleep. Drink a lot of coffee. And have some preventing tablets that you took off a kraut. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Gwen Stefanazzi. Yep. Oh, no. no <laughs> hey. No. We don't want to get sued. Gwen Stefani is not a Nazi. As far as we are uh, aware, we don't I know. don't know that she's gone on the record. Has she ever made a public statement? She hasn't, but for the we'll give her the benefit of the doubt. Jason, let me ask you a question. If any celebrity right now just made a public statement, un, unmotivated, to say that they were not yeah. a Nazi, would you be like, mm, you're probably a Nazi? 
We're getting word from Cato Kalin's people. Oh, he's no. just saying that he's not a Nazi. Well, well Cato Kalin just misses being in the news. That's true. Why That's is that? True. The, why reason. is that your celebrity poll? Because <laughs> you know what? I like to think that I'm thinking of him if nobody else is. And this is how deeply entrenched I am in the world of Saturday Night Live. You mentioned Cato Kalin. All I could think of is David Spade. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, okay. So, that guy, I, I, we need to talk about. I'm going to lose my mind if we don't talk about Ragazzi because Ragazzi is supposed to be gay, right? <laughs> is he? I think so. Well, I don't know. It's 1949. I thought he was just. Gay. I just. I just thought he was flamboyantly Italian. I mean, I thought he was a Jewish stereotype at one point because he's going around being like, oh, look at that physique. Look at that physique. Oh, I'm going to get you in Hollywood. Kefilta Kef- fish, I think he says at one point. <laughs> just go with it. And <laughs> no, but he's always like, and every, every, whenever there's a guy with a shirt on, he, he like swoops into the scene. He's like, oh, look at that physique. We're going to get you. We're going to get you into Hollywood. And I kept saying like at first... It's, it seemed like a silly bit, but then I was like, me thinkest uh, thou doth protest too much. I suppose it's possible. I just, and maybe this is just me being blind, but I just got the sense that he just was a guy. He's just like, he's one of those guys. He's Italian. He's a loud mouth. Uh, not in a bad way. He's just, he likes to talk. He likes to do bits. He likes to be out there. But maybe, maybe it is a little more on the nose, so well, to speak, you know? I also thought it was either, I thought he was, they were either coding him as gay or stereotypically Jewish because I also thought like, oh, they're making him like a Hollywood agent because he's like, I'm going to represent you, get you out in Hollywood. Yeah. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> but they, there is a Jewish character, but I, I think he shows up later and he's pretty just he doesn't say a whole lot and then when he dies he's like he's praying he's saying something in hebrew and then he dies and john wayne's there and just goes ah man i don't believe there was a person of color in this movie and if there was they must have been in the background because i did not notice Mm. and you were looking i well i tried it especially in old movies i yeah i keep my eyes out i want to see if there's (laughs) You were if the they just if they even got uh, got a job, you know. You were the one to mention during uh, a matter of life and death that they seem to have segregated heaven. I remember that. Yeah, that that's still. I love that movie. That's my number one British movie. That's your number one British mm. movie, but that's still a little uh, disturbing. Still shocking, folks. If you look, go back and listen to our, our our episodes on so many British movies that we did through a hundred British films. Jason and I both agreed on the same best movie. It's crazy, and it's not even like one you'd expect. It wasn't like Lawrence of Arabia or Bridge on the River Kwai. It was fucking matter of life and death. For fuck's sakes. Yeah. So check that one out. Yeah. But we're talking about Sands of Iwo Jima. Yeah. We're on the other side of the. Uh, the world, because I assume he crashed somewhere in the North Atlantic. Any of the other characters where... you wanted to talk about? Uh, so we talked about Thomas and his shit. We talked about the Italian guy. Well, there's a <laughs> there's a Greek guy, um, who that who the Italian guy at the beginning. He's like, oh, and this is uh, Papadopoulos. Uh, he's Irish. <laughs> Okay, is that all we got about that character? Well, I, I think he was identifying everybody. He's like, oh, this is uh, Bobby, and he's Greek, yeah. and this guy here, he's from the Midwest, and this guy, he's uh, Jewish. And- I will say, one of the easier uh, movies for me to recognize one face from another. They did they did some good white guy uh, face blindness differentiation. <laughs> Yeah, I, it helped with the performances too. Like I found Conway and Thomas, especially, were very distinct from each other and stood out. And uh, of course, our Italian friend. Yeah. And uh, uh, but I always, and then of course the Greek guy because he had the accent. I kept I kept not being able to find it, figure out who John Wayne was though. That was the that was the one for me. That was the one sticking point. <laughs> well, yeah, just less for the guy who talks like this. It's very. I love how your impression is very sing song. Well, that's how I learned it. <laughs> um, Jason, what about okay? I I know we're just we're all over the map because who fuck who the fuck cares? It's our show. We'll do yeah. what we want. Yeah. Can we talk about the whole thing where they go to um, where they're in New Zealand? And I I thought it was so funny when they were stationed in New Zealand. They're at that party with all those ladies because they hardly get anyone that's native to that area to speak and it's because they definitely did not hire new zealand actors no no they they didn't step one foot closer to new zealand while filming that and the fact that the one girl that's supposed to be from new zealand again played by adele mara playing allison bromley not even attempting a new zealand accent sounding completely 100 percent american um 
<laughs> yeah, and it's just like everybody else is just. And then that's the scene I was talking about where I said, "Wow, there's so many, so many actresses with no lines <laughs> because the guys are just like, yeah." And then I did this, and I went into battle, and they're just like, "Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm." Yeah. Well, it, I was thinking about this while I was watching this scene, and I think you know, like you say, this was one of the first after Battleground, you know, World War II movies after the war, and I think part of what made this movie as popular as it was at the time and maybe makes it holds up is that it, it is a broad, it allows people to broadly relate to the experiences of being in the war. Well, I thought you were just going to say uh, it has wh- a bunch whether of broads. That's, <laughs> whether that's from the perspective of the guys who were there, because you know, they can kind of relate to what's going on in the combat, even if it is, you know, it's not exactly realistic necessarily, but you know, it's pretty bloodless in comparison. Um, but like what's going on in the home front, it's kind of a, uh, it's similar to the combat where it's kind of a filtered version of it. What's going on on the home front, sort of a filtered version of it that people can relate to because they go through a whole relationship very quickly. Mm. You know, they meet, they dance, they're dancing cheek to cheek before they even know each other's names. Uh, they quickly get married. This is Conway and, and uh, Allison. Conway and Allison. And he knocks her up uh, before he goes back to combat, of course. Um and, and but that's but what I'm saying is is that people watching this movie at that time probably knew multiple women and guys that had gone through that yeah. that, had, that had had quick marriages that that had you know had a kid or whatever like that and some of those guys didn't come back and some did I, uh, yeah I, I was just gonna say this to me is a lot more realistic than a lot of these movie relationships are in some of these war movies where they just it it's not like they're on shore leave when they meet. It's like these two people just meet and then they get together and then they're married. Oh, and they're having a kid. Oh, now he's going to war. Like it's much more realistic to me in this movie because like you said, he's just stationed there. He knows he's probably going to go off to war at some point soon. So yeah. you do it quick, you know, <laughs> you can, you meet a girl. You, okay. Look, we're hitting it off. Hey, you want to get married? Okay. Hey, let's fucking have a kid. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, a lot. Of course, a lot of it is in those days. If you wanted to have sex and get away with it, you pretty much had to be married. You know, you didn't want to ruin. A, I mean, of course, if you were a guy, you were fine, but you wouldn't want to ruin a nice lady's name. Certainly. Well, that's what that uh, "Baby It's Cold Outside" song is mostly about. Yeah, yeah, it's about like, hey, why don't you stay? Because I got to go back to war. I'm shipping out to Vietnam tomorrow. <laughs> I'm shipping out. To, yeah, that's the uh, Dropkick Murphys' other song. Shipping yeah, out, to shipping out to Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they do. They do a. So, it's a cover of a door song, actually. Sure, but I also want to talk about the the actual landing scenes in this movie. Yeah. We have two of them. We have we have the one at Tarawa, and we have the one at uh, Iwo Jima proper. And I was super impressed. Mm. I with thought the what first, they did in this movie. The first battle scene, I think, was my favorite of the two. But both of them were pretty solid. Now, I don't know for sure, but I have to assume that this movie had some cooperation from the military uh, because they had access to quite a lot of surplus equipment. Jason, did you not see the message at the very beginning of the movie? It's like, <laughs> Oh, did it specifically say? Oh, it was like the military, the Air Force, blah, 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 is like proud to include, like have the inclusion and support of the American military, government, all that shit. Okay. Oh, yeah. They were very, very involved with this movie. Yeah, well, And this is the perfect time to make a World War II movie because in addition to, you know, the, there being an appetite for it, despite it just happening, uh, you got all this surplus equipment that's still around that you can use. And so they have the full on, I'm, I'm not even sure what they're called, but because when I think of a, a beach landing, I always think of like D-Day, right? Where mm. they're on those, uh, they're on the, the boats that just drop the door and you run off them. These guys are on essentially like APCs that can, that can function both as boats and, and as tracked vehicles with machine guns on them and shit. So they can drive right up on the beach and they got a bunch of them and they got guys in them. And then, Using that and cleverly uh, inter inter uh, spurst stock footage, yes. like it done so well. Like yes. a lot of times we see these old movies with stock footage, and it's kind of haphazard. Um, I thought the, the was it the battle at the end of Air Force maybe or mm-hmm. one of those ones mm-hmm. where they used a lot of stock footage, and it was pretty cool what they managed to do with it. But this one, this was the stock footage was then combined with like full on like battle scenes like explosions going off like and a lot of wide shots too where you get a real sense of scale because you've got all these guys there there were lots of dudes that were wearing military uniforms playing soldiers in this it it was quite quite impressive and a lot of extras in this movie were people that were actually at Iwo Jima like I think they said that the a couple of the people that raised the flag were a couple of the people that actually raised the flag which is crazy to think about (laughs) Well, and the the admiral that ran that whole operation visited the like was was a consultant or something or visited the set or something. Yeah. He was there. Um, like, yeah, it was 
they had a lot of input from people who were actually involved in this. Yeah, and and like you said, the battles. I yeah, I thought that I thought this was the best example, possibly that we've seen so far of of uh, mixing in stock footage with with combat scenes. Like you could you could still yeah. tell. Like you could still tell when it was like stock footage, oh, yeah. but it was that they they put some effort into making the film stock look pretty similar. Like they they did do a good job at that. Also, I'm pretty sure we saw some real deaths on screen, Jason. I was gonna say I know I saw a real body on fire in one of the scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was some real stock footage. Um, oh man, speaking of fire, <laughs> we get to we get the flame tanks brought out in this movie. I did not expect that. I mean, they were definitely using them in the Pacific, but when I think of the flame, I always think of the flamethrower guys, which they bring up. But they bring out the fucking full tank to just blast a pillbox and fry everybody inside. Also. I think the producers hired no more than 10 Asian people to be in this movie. Possibly less. They may have doubled. Well, uh, <laughs> I will say that at the very, very least, they at least hired people from Asia. Yeah, or at least of, of an Asian complexion. Or at least I mean, a, they could have been Hawaiian for all we know. At least not, At least they weren't white people with makeup on. Yeah, no, they were actual actual people that fit the role, and uh, which was something. Although, because we don't actually see very many Japanese soldiers in the course of this movie. No, but I will say that um, again, uh, <laughs> giving very um, slight credit to this movie for not because I want I, it, at the same time it's a credit and a demerit, but I think it's more of a credit and that they don't give them any lines. But the reason I say it's kind of a credit is that I shudder to think what lines they would have given them. Or how they would have had them deliver it. Like, I feel like it would have been very stereotypical. And, I mean, and what, while they kind of... While throughout the movie, soldiers refer to them with racist terms that were common yeah. during the war. Like, they don't... I, like, there's no point in the movie where they really, like, demonize the soldiers. That, or even where they're like, oh, they're savages and they won't surrender. And they'll yeah. do this and that. And there's none of that. No, it doesn't ever feel like... Like, J- John Wayne doesn't have, like, a monologue about, it, like, oh, the Japanese soldier is is not a follower of God and what they do yeah. is they their whole mission is to is to kill Jesus and you're like wait what I don't think that's true the, 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 what you got to understand about the Japanese is that they support eventual presidential candidate Hillary Clinton <laughs> who will be born in 5 or 6 years actually no I'm sure she was probably already alive <laughs> do you think do, uh, yeah she was very she was a ch- kid though Hey, sorry to break in, but this is Jason with a quick editor's note. And the editor's note is this. The year 1947 ended up being very important because it was the year that Henry Ford died, but also the year that Hillary Clinton was born. This has been an editor's note. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, she was a tiny baby. Do you think uh, Do you think John Wayne would have been a Trump supporter, or do you think he's such a staunch Republican that he would have been, like, anti-Trump Republican? Oh, he would have loved Trump. You think so? He would have loved him. He would have been gone to dinner with him. He would have enjoyed his presence. They yeah. would have smoked cigars together. Well, no, actually, Donald Trump wouldn't smoke cigars. He'd make John Wayne do it outside, but John Wayne would. He do, He did. I mean, I'm sure he liked... Uh, wait, was he even... No, he wasn't even alive for Reagan's presidency. Okay, we don't know how that would have went. Okay. I, I think he probably was buddies with Reagan, because Reagan used to be the head of the Screen Actors uh, Union. Reagan was liberal for a while. Well, until he met Nancy. Nancy... Pelosi. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Conspiracy theory. Nancy Reagan is actually Nancy Pelosi. Have you ever looked at Nancy Pelosi? Have you ever seen them in a room together at the same time? Uh, sir, this is a picture right here of them together. That's fake. Fake news. That's fake. AI. It's all AI. AI. That's going to be my new thing. It's not going to be fake news. It's going to be AI. That's AI. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep fake. It's a deep fake of a deep fake. It is my understanding that there is no... They have never made a sequel... To Ghostbusters, um, excuse me, sir. There is a Ghostbusters two, a Lady Ghostbusters, and a Ghostbusters of Paul Rudd, and a new one coming out. Prove it. Well, uh, here's uh, several uh, videotape cassettes. AI. It's all AI. It's man. All AI. It's all fake. You made those. Those are home movies. I mean, <laughs> I, I, Dan Aykroyd, Bill Murray, and Harold Ramis. You hired them. I don't know how you did it, but you did nope, it. No, those are home movies. Those are those are episodes of home movies that you taped off Cartoon Network and put them on the tape. <laughs> Cartoon Network. These are live action, sir. Really good, really good animation. Really good animation. <laughs> not a movie though. Not a sequel. Next question, please, and please keep your questions about the new uh, COVID twenty eight uh, debacle. Thank you. Well, let's talk about the end of this movie. Um, 
So they, they uh, Iwo Jima, you know, they make the attack. Uh, they lose some friends along the way, but they uh, they get up the hill. They get up Mount Suribachi, and we're just getting ready every to time, watch the. F- every time you say that, by the way, I think of you as Dennis Miller, just being like Mount Suribachi. Suribachi, babe. <laughs> Yeah, that would be a good reference for Dennis. <laughs> it's like climbing up Mount Sarabachi I haven't with been, a Japanese battleship on you. I haven't panted this much since I got to the top of Mount Sarabachi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dennis. Anyway. You wouldn't have been in the war. They climb um, up, yes. Yeah, they climb up there, and they take a minute. They they sit down, and they're like, uh, how you feeling, Sarge? You know, well, he's offered a cigarette, and everybody's like, I'm feeling better than I've ever felt before. And then, boom, sniper shot. And John Wayne is dead. I was shocked. Yeah, no, I was shocked too. And I'm sure people at the time were probably shocked because this was not your usual uh, end for a heroic character I, in a movie like this. I also I didn't know John Wayne died in movies. Like I thought he was always mm. like the guy at the end that made it through and was heroic and everything. I was, uh, I was shocked to see. I, just like I, I'm assuming that happens in the Shootist, which was his last movie where he's like literally dying. But I'm not sure. Yeah. But I but I was shocked to see it in this. I was like, oh, oh, like when they have the scene right before, I knew someone was going because they had the scene right before where Conway was like, this is a picture of my kid. Look at my baby. Yeah. Look at my new baby that I'm definitely going home to after the war. I'm so excited yeah. to see my cute little baby. And I thought Conway's dead. Yeah. And then so when John Wayne got shot, I was like, God damn. <laughs> And it happens so quick. There's no, like, death rattle. There's no, like, he's yeah. laying there saying his last words. He's shot. It's brutal. You even see, like, the yeah. bullet in his back, like, the bullet yeah. hole in his back. And I was like, I was, I was surprised. Yeah, and I think I think that must be the influence of the guys that were there. Like, because mm. they knew the, the Hollywood death scenes were bullshit. Yeah. People just were beside you one second talking to you, and the next minute they were fucking dead. It was over in an instant. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It felt it felt real. It didn't it didn't feel like you, you, you tell mama you tell no. mama you go you go to sew them hands. Sew them hands. You're no. delirious. You must be dying. No, you tell her. You tell her you go sew them hands. I'm coming for you, daddy. You know, that kind well, of thing. It's it's like that old saying, man, you never hear the one that gets you. That's right. Bang. Yeah. It remind you know what, and, and this is a little side note. Sure. One of the one of the Darkest moments I've felt in a video game. The, uh, years the Sands ago, of Iwo I, I was, Jima video game? No, 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 no. <laughs> but I was playing a, a World War II video game. It was oh. a mod for Half-Life <laughs> uh, called Day of Defeat. Yeah, yeah. And this was something at the time that I think they must have changed later on. But, like, at the time when you were playing it, if you were, you know, you were going through and shooting guys or whatever, if you got sniped in the head, if you got a headshot to you, your screen just went black. Whoa. Jesus. And it would just wait to respawn you. And that was very unsettling. <laughs> and it was for, <laughs> the first few times it happened. First person, I'm assuming. Yeah, it was a first person game. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're it just, just boom, black, done. Damn. Yeah. Well. But yeah, so he dies kind of a heroic death or not. I mean, not really that heroic. He got sniped. But like, you know, it's a, it's an interesting moment because he's like, I never felt better than I ever had before. We also, uh, the other scene that kind of gave him a, a soft softer quality was when he uh john we didn't really talk about it but when john wayne goes to like visit that prostitute and he's clearly yeah. there for a hookup and then he hears something in the room and he thinks there's someone coming in so he like opens the door and there's a baby mm-hmm. and he's very much yes. like oh <laughs> like Ooh, like baby. this this woman is doing this to support her like her child like this woman is doing yeah. it to survive and there's a whole and he doesn't end up sleeping with her he gives her money and then he leaves well he, he got to be fair he gives the money to the baby yeah, but I mean, what I'm saying is he doesn't... The baby just starts eating it. <laughs> he doesn't just... Uh, what I mean is, like, he doesn't just, like, you know, take advantage of her anyway. Like, that seems to be a moment for him. Two two things, though, about this scene. One, her line delivery when she says, you know babies, is great. I love that. It's just a wonderful line. It made me laugh. And he's two, like, I know babies. I understand a woman's got to do what a woman's going to do. I'm never going to judge a person for doing what they need to do to survive and take care of their family. You understand that. I understand that. However, and, and again, I don't want to sound too judgy, but she was out trying to fuck dudes while she left her baby at home alone. That's, that's very true. <laughs> that baby true. was in the room by himself. That's very true. Well, <laughs> d- Jason, I'm sure there was another baby off screen that was watching that baby. I mean, that's what they did at the time. You know, the kids take care of each other. It's like in Jane Silent Bob Strike Back where he's like, wait, who's watching these, this baby? He's like, uh, the big one's watching the little one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, fuck you, you well, fucking square. 
<laughs> I love the Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back comes up on this war movie podcast several times. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, so there's that whole thing, and then um, and then that that yeah that letter that he says like basically mm. he's talking about his estranged son and being like you know I'm sorry I was never there for you. It's pretty emotional, and I gotta say mm. I know you you said it earlier, and I I didn't expect that I was gonna say this at all. John Wayne is really good in this movie. Yeah. Like it's a great performance. When he's in the right lane, when he's in the right spot with the right script, like, yeah, he can kill it. it and there's a reason why he was popular. Yeah, and it's not even just like a, yeah, oh, like he does really good playing John Wayne in this movie. Like, it's a genuinely affecting acting performance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, say what you will about the man um, on a personal level, which we have and always will. But, I yeah. mean, I guess this proves that uh, I, I guess I underestimated him just a little bit in terms of his uh, skill. Yeah. For sure. And that's the thing. We see these movies and, you know, I've never seen Rio Bravo or um, oh, what's the other one where he plays the Confederate uh, soldier or is that Rio Bravo? I don't know. I will say I, I should I shouldn't I shouldn't uh, jump that far because I, I do remember I I did see the searchers and I don't remember it a lot. Searchers, That's the one. Yeah, I don't remember it a lot. But I'm sure he was good in that, too. But the, I guess I'm basing this more on the <laughs> the, the uh, conqueror. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's much better in this than he is in the Conqueror. Temu Jen. He he seems to have like he just has like he he's more emotive than I expected, and he's got pathos, and and you could see it on his face, and he's not just like running through the lines. Like it just it feels like I think it's the best performance in the movie. To be honest, yeah, and it's 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 clear that John Wayne, despite having not served in war, was able to more closely relate to the average American GI than he was to uh, Genghis Khan. Weird. Weird he yeah, wouldn't weird. Re- relate as much to a Chinese emperor uh, <laughs> from, from hundreds Mongol of years emperor, ago. emperor, thank you very sorry, much. Sorry, sorry. Uh, stop tearing down my shitty wall, yeah. Um, <laughs> Jason, we're not going to commercial before we talk about the dance sequence. With J- And I'm not talking about oh. in the hall. I'm talking about John Wayne <laughs> and that other soldier in a bayonet. Yeah. Please tell me about yeah, that weird- and tell me how accurate you think that was. I mean, a weirdly lighthearted moment, I guess. Not that this movie's super dark or anything, but just like this soldier that he bayonet and then bayonet, but he like rifle butted in the face to to teach a lesson about hand to hand combat. You know, he's a big dude, he's a big farm boy, and he's not particularly light on his feet. So John Wayne's solution is to basically make him dance with him. And he starts like hopping around dancing to uh, uh, some sort of weird remix of Mexican hat dance mixed with the Marine anthem. Uh, then somebody happens to have on a record player, which is like, that's the record you bring of all the record you all like Andrew's sisters or anything else that's popular at the time. Some count Bassey or something. No, you bring this fucking weird marching music shit. Can I, can I, come on. Can I tell you my theory on this whole thing? Yeah. I feel like, cause you know, they had like uh, people on set that were like, you know, um, telling them about the accuracy and, and consulting and everything. Right. I feel like somebody was like getting pissed off at John Wayne because he kept like st- kind of swaggering around like he'd been in battle and stuff and they were like he never fucking went to war so i feel like some soldier was like fuck this asshole yeah john yeah no this is what we did to train with bayonets yeah we just danced yeah you should put that I in the movie it was a rib. <laughs> <laughs> you should put it in the movie because that's what happened it's real and uh totally you should just put it in the movie john and he's like yeah. well if oh, you maybe. say so pilgrim and that's what he said. Exactly. <laughs> you can quote him on that. Um, but I mean, it works. It, it, it He gets the sense of like, you know, he, you know, he, well, and also John Wayne's character, uh, uh, Stryker, was a boxer, we learned, because him and Thomas had uh, uh, boxed each other and Thomas had lost. Mm. Right. So in addition to the dancing, he's got that light on his feet like a boxer. And yes. that was what I was getting, like the kind of the shuffling back and forth, which I don't know. <laughs> it would be really funny in combat. Like you're coming up on a guy and he's like, all of a sudden he pulls out his bayonet and he starts bouncing around like, oh, come on, <laughs> float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Come on, try and get me. <laughs> and then you just shoot him like you're Indiana Jones. Yeah. that. Oh, pff, I mean, that'd be great. I want, please, yeah. let's do that. Um, you and I, let, right now, let's go to, where is this again? <laughs> uh, right here on the island of Iwo Jima. All right, let's, let's, let's do the Indiana Jones with someone. Um, All right. Yeah, okay. Well, Jason, anything, uh, any big things you want to talk about before we take a break? I imagine it'll be in, uh, in the next segment. Well, let's go to it then. Let's take a brief break, and we will be right back. Hey there, Pilgrim. It's your old pal John Wayne. Look, I'm sorry about a lot of the things I said. I wasn't very smart, and I didn't know a lot. I've been dead a while, and I've had a lot of time to think. 
So with that in mind, I want to say to you, to all my favorite pilgrims, Age of Radio, check it out. Pilgrim. Now, you don't mind if I sing your little intro song, do you? Please, please, Mr. Wayne, do it. All right. <clears throat> now, you might be startled by my singing voice. I haven't done it in a while. <clears throat> well, at least at least not since the beginning of the episode. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> It's time for bits and bombs. It's time for bits and bombs. Jason's got some bits and bombs, and Brandon's got bits and bombs. I'm sorry, I'm a big fan of the Muppet Show. We're gonna have some bits, and we're gonna have some bombs. Maybe some bits and bombs, and bits and bombs, and bombs and bits, and bits and bombs, and bombs and bits. It's time for some bits and bombs over Screening Country. Oh, bits and bombs. That was all John. Amazing. So what's interesting, okay, this is a movie about Iwo Jima. I wrote down that this is an, an early take on an important moment because we will see many more movies about Iwo Jima. Specifically, the one that comes to mind for me is Flags of Our Fathers and um, uh, the other one, letter, the, Letters from Iwo Jima. I was going to say, the one that literally has it in the title that I mentioned earlier, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the the better one. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that, uh, you know, and this is this is a legendary moment in American military history, uh, taking this particular island. Because it's, as you can see in the movie, and you see better in other movies, but... Like Suribachi is a pretty sheer cliff face. Like it's very high, so it was very difficult to uh, get up that thing. Jason, this is just such a silly off off offshoot thing. But you were you. I now I now realize why when you say Suribachi, I laugh inside because all I could think of is when we found that song that went Caravaggio. Oh, oh, oh. yeah, that was a great song. <laughs> I don't know why that's coming man. to mind. <laughs> um, I I want to we'll say have fun thinking about that ha- hashtag old Hollywood. I love when they when the credits say um, a certain actor is in this movie by arrangement with another studio because mm. of those fucking the contract old, days. terrible contract days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was yeah. It was like it'd be, it'd be like having a baseball player from a different team play with your team. One of my one of my notes is John Wayne was young. <laughs> yeah, he was, and this wasn't like what was his it was earliest. Like big movie, anyways, was what Stagecoach, and that was like 1939. But he was, I think he may have even been in Silence. Oh, possibly. I mean, he's only 40 yeah. in this movie, yeah. like 41 maybe. But like, he's that's pretty okay. young for John Wayne because he was like he acted right up until the end. He like I said, his last movie was The Shootist, and he died like yeah. three years later, I think. Yeah. Uh, the soldiers in this movie. This is a movie from the 40s, so there's a lot of gee golly kind of uh, attitudes of guys and but you know what they're all nice they're all like like and other movies we would see like kind of real strife in the unit like there'd be some guys that really didn't like each other um the closest we come is there's a pair of brothers that are always fighting with each other because they're brothers yeah and they're arguing over their shit i did notice a lot of um people seem to have a really hard time with uh, not looking over their shoulder before they started talking shit about someone that happens several <laughs> times kept, yeah Stryker's always behind them somewhere, and they're talking shit about him. But to his credit, he doesn't say nothing. He, he just kind of like looks at them until he like walks up by them. He's like, "Well, you better focus on the job at hand, Pilgrim." He doesn't like, and that's again why, and that's again why I don't think he was overly cruel, like stuff like that. But Conway does that several times, and a couple other characters do too. Yeah. Where I'm like, just take a quick gander behind you before you start talking about someone. You're a soldier. You should know your surroundings. You should be aware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <sighs> oh, what's a liberty? Is that like R and R? Liberty just means that's your time off. Okay. So it's like you get ten days liberty, or you get uh, liberty pass for the night, or something like. Okay. Yeah, it's just time off so, from the military. So, it's where you're allowed to go do what you want to so do. So it's R and R, essentially. Yeah. yeah, they go back. They, so it's, it's when they all dress up and go dancing and shit and drinking. And, um, yeah. I really enjoyed that one soldier mansplaining Tennessee to that girl at the party. And Tennessee is uh, the state where the most manure in the world is produced. I mean, I think it's meant to be funny, but it's also like, it just yeah. feels so, it just, that girl is like, I don't give a shit about Tennessee. I don't care about Tennessee. Are you going to fuck me or not? Yeah, I'm from, we're in New Zealand. You're so far from Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one line that uh, um, I think Stryker says that made me go, uh, phrasing, I'm going to ride you all till you can't stand up. 
But when you stand up, you'll be Marines. Mm, he's going to fuck them into being Marines. That's right. That's right. That's how you do it. Yeah. Uh, this made me laugh. Just, again, sign of the time. But they Because when they go to the dance, right, there's a booth at the back, which kind of looks like a canteen, except written above it, painted on the wall, is free cigarettes from the folks back home. Yes. <laughs> I knew you. I I, yes. didn't, I didn't even write that one down because I said Jason's going to see it and mention it. <laughs> oh, absolutely! Free cigarettes. Ah, those are the days. I, Just handing out cartons to the boys. I like this dialogue exchange where Conway says, "I'm going to get married," and I forget who says it, but they say, "Eh, you'll feel better in the morning." Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Also, um, I like when they they go to that party in New Zealand, and it's it's like the music is so like somber and everything, and then one guy just gets up and starts playing like the trumpet. It's just like fucking yeah. interrupts the set. He's like, I'm gonna liven up this old sad bastard music. Yeah, good for him. And he dies later in the movie, but uh, he's a good guy. Yeah. Uh, what else we got here? Oh, at one point Conway says to the guy beside him, he's like, Bob, do you believe in love at first sight? And it just made me laugh because it was so a propo of nothing. I mean, it wasn't a propo of nothing because he'd been with the girl, but it's just, you imagine Bob just being like, what? <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> imagine if he had said that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I mean, it would, they would have beat MASH by 30 years. Um, uh, uh, I, I think there's a quote in this movie that's lifted from Patton, from not the movie Patton, but from actual like George Patton, because someone says, um, let the other guy die for your country or for his country. Yeah. You live for yours. Uh, yeah, I think, I think in, in the movie. Yeah, in the movie, Patton, anyways, I don't well, know about Patton. I think Patton did say something like that. But in the movie, he says, your job is not to die for your country. Your job is to make the other poor bastard die for his. Well, I think. Yeah, I, but I think that the line in the movie is pulled from real a real quote. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure it was referencing Patton. Absolutely. Jason, I got to ask um, you. I'm going to ask this delicately. I th- now, when you call someone yella, you're saying they're a coward, right? Sure. Is that racially tinged? No. Okay, because at one point... No, you're yellow belly. Because at one point, John Wayne calls the enemy lemon-colored, and I wasn't sure if he was being racist or if he was just saying they were oh, yellow. Oh, no, he was being racist. Oh, was he? I'm oh, pretty oh. sure he was being racist. Oh, okay. No, he wasn't okay. saying they were cowards because that would be stupid. He's fought the Japanese. He knows you could say anything you want about the Japanese, but you can't call them cowards. Yeah, okay. Because there was a there was a word, and we don't need to say what it was, but there was a word they kept repeating in reference to the yeah. Japanese, and I was like, okay, so I'm getting used to them just saying this. And then when he said that, I was like, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. No, that was absolutely, there's no way that was... About anything but their race. Mm, okay. Conway took a swing at Stryker at one point, which is like, ah, man, I know, but you can't you can't swing on your sergeant. Somebody sees that, you're going to jail, and you're not getting out for a long time. Mm. But again, Stryker did rifle butt someone <laughs> earlier. Yeah, yeah, but that's the thing. Like, the guy, the kid kind of, like, it, it comes back around. Like, it has that moment with the dance later on. Like, that's the mm-hmm. thing about Stryker is that he's, like, uh, if I compare him to Gene Evans' character in um, uh, Sergeant Zack, of course. The Steel Helmet, the yeah. Steel Helmet. Like, like uh, Sergeant Zack is not a character that necessarily needs to be liked. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do come to like him because we, we, we understand what he's going through or we kind of get why he is the way he is, whereas... Stryker's character, it's like, well, the way the movie is, you can't really have Stryker's character be too unlikable, at least, and especially with John Wayne. And I feel like he, John Wayne would never allow his character to have that scene like his, the character did in The Steel Helmet where he shot that guy. Remember yeah, when, no, when the kid no. gets killed and he takes it out on, on that sold, unarmed prisoner? John yeah, Wayne would exactly. have nope. never let that happen. <laughs> no, no, no. The idea of an American committing a war crime? No. Come on. That never ha- happened. Well, the thing is, Jason, it's just fantasy, and it obviously never happened. The steel helmet is fantasy, and we can enjoy it, but clearly the army was on the up and up. Nothing bad ever happened. Yeah, it was a, it was a, clean, it was a clean army. We had the log was... ride back where we were stationed. We, were, we, we, the Allies, were only clean in comparison to the Axis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did like that when he, when John Wayne finds out um, what happened with Thomas, where he stopped to get coffee, and because of that, indirectly, you know, one of the guys, they didn't get ammo in time, one of the guys died, and the other one was brutally injured. When he finds that out and he starts kicking Thomas's ass, when Thomas covers for him, uh, it doesn't feel like John Wayne forgives him because of that. He almost forgives no. him because clearly Thomas already accepts his own guilt and understands what yeah. he's done. 
And it's that's a really nice moment because it's like it's a moment well, and, of warmth for for Stryker, but it's also like and Stryker uses it to drive home the lesson again be in that training mode, the lesson that like every second counts. Yeah, that you need to be on the ball because you can't fuck around. If you you can waste thirty seconds, you can waste forty minutes. Somebody could die. Yes. Now I I had said this movie's a bit sterile, and it is because this is this is a piece of fast entertainment. And it's not you know. This isn't this isn't even all quiet in the Western Front. This is but I was impressed that there was a scene where a guy gets shot on the beach and we see him with a bullet hole in the middle of his head, like with blood running down his face. Well, and when the guys get bayoneted, uh, get the bayonets in the trench, you see the aftermath and it's quite bloody. What about what about that? Can, can I ask you, would they actually be training with live grenades? Yeah. OK, because I don't see why not. <laughs> they would be do because they want them to know what a real grenade feels like to throw because you can't simulate everything. Right. you got to actually be able to huck it and know what it's like. Because <laughs> when that guy drops it behind his back, I was like, oh, this feels like a yeah. Benny Hill moment. <laughs> like, it's just like, whoa. Well, and there was there's half of me that thought, oh, is this going to be the moment that Stryker dies? Like he's just going to huck, uh, throw himself on a grenade. I and thought he was going to jump on it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but no, he he did catch some shrapnel, but it didn't kill him, thankfully, for Stryker. He was able to live until the end of the movie. Till he got the hero's death. Yeah. Uh, he died as he lived with a bullet in his back. Yeah. Oh, there was uh, something that was kind of funny to me. There was an American... We see an American major at one point who is... I feel like he he's stuck in the last war on the wrong side because he's he's wearing a Kaiser Wilhelm mustache, like oh, a yes. very like pointy... Like it looks like a W. I saw and that, that was the style in Imperial Germany. I, I was making a note and looked up and saw that mustache, and I was like, uh, "Did he walk yeah. into the wrong set?" <laughs> yeah. However, Hello, I'm here for the know, propaganda movie. <laughs> yes, but of course, the military. You know, most militaries, pretty conservative organizations, often have guys with strange mustaches. It's just mm. it's tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, and think about the British with their chops or their wax mustaches. You know. Um, there was a, there was a, a soldier who died and then we saw in his pocket, he had a book that said, our hearts were young and gay. Ba, ba, ba. A little bit, a little bit of a uh, poetic, poetic, uh, imagery there. Yeah. I just, I just, it just reminds me every time I see that, the word gay in an old movie, I'm like, oh yeah, it just means happy. <laughs> um, that, that lady that John Wayne goes to shack up with. She must live above a liquor store because she leaves to go get whiskey and she's back in like 45 seconds. Like he finds the baby and says hello. And that's about all he has time for because mm -hmm. she's back from the store that quick. Man, why don't I have a liquor store in my basement? And I was just trying to look up and see. Oh, this is. Oh, this is interesting. OK, Jason, I'm just, I wanted to look up because I said there must be something significant about this book. Why they use that specific book. And it's like, OK, yeah. it's about a, it, the book presents a description of a European tour in the 1920s uh, with an actress and a journalist. OK, blah, 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 blah. But then it says during the Second World War, someone discovered that this book was used as a code book by German intelligence. Oh, Interesting. So are we to understand that he found the German code book and that was in his pocket? Because that's a really interesting yeah. twist. They don't delve into that's it at a, all. Yeah, I can say that's a deep pull. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's maybe that's like an Easter egg, an early Easter egg sort of thing that he would because you can see the poetic use of yeah. it, of this young guy dying in combat and having a book called We Were Young and Gay in it. But uh, yeah, I, I, that's awesome. I have no idea. And that's, yeah, if, if so, that's a fantastic detail that they added. Yeah, it's this movie's version of, like, when Pixar puts, like, other Pixar characters in the background. <laughs> yeah, unless they were, like, somehow implying he was a spy, which would be even weirder. Uh, that'd be very weird, because nothing was set up that way. <laughs> no. Unless no, it was no. the guy... I mean, he looked like a pretty... He looked like a pretty corn-fed Midwestern ginger. Like I don't know that he oh, looked okay. pretty particularly German. I was gonna say I missed who it was. I was gonna be. I was gonna say it would be something if it was that that guy with the mustache. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I am a loyal American. No, yes. I just want. I just want to read about the European tour. I'm just really yeah, excited I... about Emily checks notes. R Rothschild. I am hoping someday to visit this Europe I have heard so much about. <laughs> I am, but as you know, I am 100% Yankee American apple pie. Yes, born and raised in Mississippi. In baseball, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Babe Ruth, Powerful. am I right? Now, this movie doesn't have a whole lot of comment on the nature of war as far no. as like deeper philosophical stuff, but at one point... 
one of the guys is talking about how they've sacrificed so many men for this rock. And the guy goes, that's war, boy. And he's like, what's war? He goes, trading real estate for men. Mm. That's, yeah. I mean, think, I mean, especially if, uh, if any of these guys had either been in World War One or had fathers that were in World War One, you know, talk about a war that was trading thousands of lives for ground that could be measured in feet. Yeah. Yeah, as far as, pr- um, like, propaganda war movies go, um, it didn't... I wasn't, like, enraged while watching this. I actually... No. That was one of my worries when I heard about this movie, and maybe it would have been more founded if this movie had come out in, like, 1943. That would have been like, oh, okay, what are we doing here? <laughs> but, but I think I think releasing it after the war did give it a little bit of time to breathe, and uh, maybe allowed them to scale that back just a bit. Yeah. Uh, of course, they have that scene, uh, you know, where they raise the flag. They got to do their famous recreation of the 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 image of the four guys or five guys or whatever pulling the flag pole up. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Okay, we got it. We salute it. We all stand up and cheer and clap. Um, that was that year. That was that year's stand up and cheer award at the Oscars, by the way. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fame, I mean, it was uh, is what the f- flash entering the speed force owes. Its well, to. I mean, it, it's not quite as much of a stand up and cheer moment as the flash entering no. the speed force. Certainly not. We all know where we were when that happened. We all remember it very well. Um, I'll never forget. I'll never forget. No, uh, I'll never forget seeing that movie in theaters and not remembering any of the plot. <laughs> No, I, well, you couldn't remember anything because everybody just stood up and wouldn't stop cheering. Would just, you couldn't watch the movie because we just didn't stop. It's like when you hear about uh, movies debuting at con and getting like a 20-minute standing ovation. Like, that's pretty much what it was. It was like that happened. He entered the Speed Force and that was it. Yeah. Nobody saw the rest of the movie. Well, they, we were just cheering the entire time. Well, they had to turn on the subtitles because people were cheering so loud. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was very strange. Yeah. Um, so yeah, then we have the letter to the kid. Yeah, very sad. Boo hoo. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's a very emotional. It's kind of an emotional thing. And then we have the nice bit where because Conway had kind of like buried the hatchet with Stryker right before he died, and the Conway's like, oh, "I'm going to finish this letter because it wasn't finished." Yeah, and I like how they. they... And then they all. I'm sorry. Oh, so, again. Yeah. And then they all march off into the sunset while the Marine Corps hymn plays. And I like how they didn't um, necessarily have a moment where he was like, you know, Stryker was a perfect man and uh, he was great, and I'm an idiot for doubting him. Like it didn't yeah. go full tilt like that. Well, that's all I've got, Brendan. Okay. Well, I'll I'll tell you a few more things about this movie, there, pal. Um, this movie, this script is apparently the first known work uh, to use the military idiom "lock and load," an expression meaning getting getting ready to fight. Um, I, I I like that it because it describes the action of the M1, right? That you pull the bolt back yes. and lock it into place, and then you can load your your clip. In yeah. Of eight shots. And how many movies have you seen? Heard someone say lock and load? This is apparently the first one. Uh, yeah, I know because in Star Trek: First Contact, uh, at one point I think Data says saddle up, and then and then cocks his phaser for some reason. I don't know why phasers cock, mm-hmm. and then goes lock and load. There you go. You wouldn't have Star Trek if it wasn't for John Wayne. If right. it, well, he said saddle up as well. Or, so. or as you would say, if it wasn't for John Wayne. <laughs> you wouldn't have Star Trek, Pilgrim. Um, okay, so they, obviously they had a lot of consultants on this movie. They used actual combat veterans from Iwo Jima in some of the scenes. We know that. Some other little bits of trivia about this movie. John Wayne actually turned this movie down at first because he felt that he was too old for the part at 42. And he also felt that the public had had enough of war movies. What is with all these goddamn idiots thinking that nobody's going to go see a war movie? And, and, and I mean, I, I understand like there's 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 a sense and, and we all have it of like it's like, oh, well, we just went through this war. People don't want to see movies about the war. But it turns out they do. Yeah. Like almost all the time. Uh, and I mean, and especially where, you know. With World War Two, you have this, this. It's not like something like Afghanistan or Iraq, where yeah, it's a big, it's a big cultural impact. But it's not like it's not like World War Two, where a good chunk of the male and even the female population are part of the armed forces. Right? It's it's an entire generation that shares that culture in a way that other generations don't. So for them coming back, maybe part of the catharsis of coming back, part of the way that they dealt with it was being able to see these mm-hmm. movies, these reflections of themselves, and maybe something like Sands of Iwo Jima, which again, not you know a pretty popcorn movie, was something that you know they, they could like appreciate their experience without being horrified by it, you know? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, also, again, you've said this before, but World War II 
the easiest one to do a movie of just because it's, there's such clear villain lines like nazis they're evil we hate them <laughs> it's very easy Certainly, to to yeah, not yeah. let not root for the germans or even the japanese because they were aligned with the germans right so yep. it's very easy to do that. Uh, Kirk Douglas was originally considered for the role of Stryker before uh, the director realized he could actually get John Wayne to play the part. So he went after John Wayne. I was already in a war movie it's <laughs> called Paths of Glory. Paths of Glory, where I played a French guy. Did he play a French guy? Yes, I was a French general. Just look at me and all you see is French general. I'm very excited to watch that movie, by the way. Apparently it's very good. Um it's a Kubrick film. Yeah, no, I've heard really good things. Uh, so following the success of this movie, John Wayne was actually invited to um, put his footprints in cement outside Grauman's Chinese Theater. Um, as part of the event, they actually had some some of the actual black sand from Iwo Jima and mixed it into the cement where he left his uh, footprints and fist print. Um, That's pretty cool. Yeah. Also, speaking of sand, we didn't mention this, but there's a, the Tennessee guy at one point is there and he picks up the ground. He goes, wow, this ain't this soil ain't no good. Why would anybody want to be on this island? <laughs> um, there's one scene where a striker is showing uh, Private Choinsky on the correct way to march and hold a rifle. Um, the mm-hmm. funny thing about this scene is in real life, the actor playing Choinsky, uh, Hal Baylor, was a Marine combat veteran and John Wayne had never been in the military. <laughs> Dude knew how to hold a rifle. Yeah. Of course, in the Marine Corps, famously, every man a rifleman, right? So everybody in the Marine Corps, from from the fucking guy that peels the potatoes up to the the top general, every one of them is a rifleman. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Talk about the reaction to this movie. Um, most of the stuff I have about the reaction to this movie is, like, the references made of this movie, because there's quite a few. But I will tell you that um, there was a sequel to the movie planned, starring John Wayne, called Devil Birds. Never materialized, but it was planned. Um, In the TV show, you may be familiar with this television program called King of the Hill. Um, This is the favorite. This is Cotton Hill's favorite movie, Hank's dad. Um, (laughs) Cotton Hill, of course, who killed 50 men. Yes. I don't remember that show very much. I'm sorry. Well, Cotton, but, Cotton was his his brain was a little mixed up, and he wasn't. He would often talk about the serving in both uh, fronts. Yeah, like, and I, both I, in Europe, and I think I think he actually served in the Pacific, so yeah. that made more sense. I just remember he was real little and old. Um, oh, yeah. uh, in in the show King of the Hill, uh, Hank recalls that his father would travel around Texas searching for showings of this movie. Um, <laughs> There is apparently an episode of NCIS that references this movie and the documentary. Um, there's a documentary called To the Shores of Iwo Jima, and there's some talk about this movie, so that's an interesting thing. Um, there's a southern rock band called The Drive-By Truckers that have a song called The Sands of Iwo Jima, and it's sung from the perspective of a young boy who's been exposed to World War II through old John Wayne movies. Um, yes. Apparently in the song, he asks his great uncle, uh, who is a World War II veteran, if Sands of Iwo Jima represents the war properly. And the old man uh, shakes his head and responds, I never saw John Wayne on the Sands of Iwo Jima. And that, that made me think of, I saw a video a while back, it was from a show Mel Brooks was doing. And he was up on stage and he was talking to the audience and there was another old guy in the ice. He goes, you, he goes, you were old. Were you in the war? And he goes, yeah, I was, I was in the war. And he goes, I didn't see you there. <laughs> Somebody said they didn't see Mel Brooks. No, no, Mel Brooks said to him, I didn't see you oh, there. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, this movie goes to the Oscars, Jason. It is nominated for four Academy Awards. It does not win any, but can you tell me what you think the four Oscars it's nominated for is? Oh, well, so I know some of this because I happen to, it, it, they, they put it right in the beginning of the Wikipedia article, so I caught some of them. I know John Wayne got nominated, uh, I assume for Best Actor. Yeah, the winner was uh, Broderick Crawford for All the King's Men. I'm assuming okay. the Humpty Dumpty um, biopic. I, I I think it got a nom for best cinematography. Nope. No. Uh, best uh, screenplay. Uh, well, best motion picture story, which I think is not okay. is like the story by credit, which uh, went to Harry uh, nominated uh, Harry Brown. The winner, well, though, was of course Douglas Morrow for the Stratton story. Oh yes, Stratton story, man. <laughs> oh, I'm a Stratton story. Stan. There's like at least one um, person listening that's like, "Fuck you guys, Stratton story fucking yeah. rules." Rules, you got to check it out, man. It's like, you and your buds are going to love it. It's like an O'Doyle rules situation, but Stratton story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got you got one more guess here. Uh, uh, best sound editing. Close. We get best sound recording. 
uh, Dan- okay. Daniel J. Bloomberg, of course, the sound recordist, as you know. Uh, but the winner was, uh, and we probably already talked about this, but the winner was Thomas T. Moulton uh, for 12 O'Clock High. Oh. And the other, the last Oscar it got nominated for, Jason, was Best Film Editing. Uh, but the winner that year was the movie Champion. We've mentioned that before, and you said you like Champions. So maybe we have to watch it. Sure. Um, sure yeah. BAFTAs weren't a thing yet, so no BAFTAs. It uh, it does ma- it does cost um, it does go over budget quite a bit so they ended up apparently somewhere around 1.4 million dollars in 1949 which seems like a lot mm. um, and it's estimated that it probably made about four million back so really it probably well, doubled its money I and I and you see that money on the screen in those battle yeah. scenes like they they definitely went went to the paint for that it definitely feels like they were like no we didn't get it yet let's do 80 more takes. <laughs> Um, but that's yeah. yeah, that's that's the movie. That's Sands of Iwo Jima. So Jason, uh, you know, hit us up, throw some sand in our face, tell us what your very official rating is, and uh, let us know. This I think has to be the first like mainstream blockbuster war movie, like because this is a movie that comes off more like an action movie in a lot of ways uh, than a straight war movie. And I, and what I mean by that is that this is not a rumination on the nature of war. This is not a, a look into the deep, dark, troubled soul of man. None of that stuff. This isn't about the politics of the war. This is about this unit going out and doing their thing. And, and But it, it is rendered in such an entertaining way that I can't help but like it. I mean, John Wayne, we, we, we rightfully criticize him for many things, especially in relation to his political opinions and his acting abilities. Don't read that Playboy but, interview. No, but he shows that he in the right circumstances can be as good as anybody else. And he fucking nails it. He owns this role. And Stryker is a fantastic character. Who's very interesting. He's again, he's, I, 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 I would not put him up against somebody like Sergeant Zach. Um, but this is a really good, enjoyable, rollicking war movie. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's great performances. It's great action scenes. Um, it's not even that, you know, it's only a, just 10 minutes shy of two hours. Yeah, it's an so hour. It's not terribly long. No, it's an hour and 50, and it doesn't really feel like it. It moves along no, pretty good. Pace is, it's a solid paced movie. I mean, you know, it's no King's uh, Kingsman, but it's not bad. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, overall, I got to give this uh, 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 a strong 85 pilgrims out of 99 pilgrims. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to say I was shocked. I thought this was going to be like the weakest one of this bunch that we've done so far, but I think it's actually of this and Battleground and Rescue Dawn, this might actually be my top one right now of those three. I think Mm -hmm. it was very solid. And this is a movie where it's like when I was debating on my actual rating, because I like to rate things for realsies too, um, this is like as close to a four out of five as I can get while still being a three and a half. Like it's just so close. Just, it's just something, but it's but it's so close. Mm. Um, but John Wayne is really good in this movie, and and you know there's some good supporting performances. Some of them are kind of goofy, but they're they're all having fun. It's all it's all good. Um, like you said, I agree though. This does feel like a, a blockbuster version of a war movie, and I mean that in no derogatory way at all. Um, yeah, so I would say uh, I would say it's it's a it's a solid solid movie, and I would give it. Um, Three and a half, almost four racist Playboy interviews out of five. That is a strong rating from Brendan Wall. Mm-hmm. You just wait you read Brendan Wall's Playboy interview. You can't wait to hear what he has to say about Tongans. Ooh, and I've got some... Wait, you picked a real people. <laughs> I did. <laughs> no, I don't like it. <laughs> what am I going to say? Ferengi? Klingons? What? Yeah, <laughs> you made it sound like I'm actually going to talk about a real group of people. I don't like that. <laughs> You don't even know where Tonga is. You you wait to you wait till you hear my opinion on midichlorians. Oh boy. Oh, well, I'm like I'm basically when it comes to uh Star Star Wars medicine, I'm pretty much a Scientologist. <laughs> yeah. That's terrible. Someone's just gonna take that clip and isolate it. <laughs> no, they're not, because uh, the the fa- the few fans we have are loyal, good people. You know what? I wish we were that famous enough that someone would take that clip and isolate it. Man, think of the public relations uh, coup that would be for us. Yeah, hell yeah. Um, okay, so that's Sands of Iwo Jima. We're, we're uh, packing it up into a bag and putting it into our rear view. And we are going to move on. Next week, we are sticking with the list. We're still we're still staying with the list. Now, now next week, Jason, we're going we're gonna to do something a little different because we do have a movie coming up that is two movies, essentially. It, it is a part one and a part two. And I think we've, Jason and I have both made the decision that the best course of action here would be to split it up in two episodes. Because I think we haven't seen it. 
I'm assuming Jason hasn't seen it. No, um, I'm not. Yeah, and I feel like I don't know how much movie there is to discuss here. So, you know what? You could get two regular episodes over the next two weeks, or they both could be a little shorter. I don't know. We'll find out. But next week, we are going to talk about one of my favorite film directors. Um, Jason, what are we going to talk about next week? We are going to talk about the first part in our new series of Fortnite of Che. With part one of the 2008 film directed by... Steven Soderbergh. Called Jay. Jay. Not not the Michael Che biopic, though. No, no. Uh, we, we will get to that. It's it, it's destined to be one of the great war movies. Would be wild but... if that was released in 2008. Like, what would you even say about it? <laughs> <laughs> he, really, he really had foresight about his own career. He really... It's like, if I make the documentary now... Then I'll be yeah, he puts it on. He put um, it on Instagram and then just immediately deleted it seven minutes later. <laughs> yep, as is his <laughs> yes. way. No, we're going to be talking about the life and times of one Che Ernesto Guevara, mm. uh, revolutionary thinker, guerrilla terrorist? Question mark. Uh, we're going to find all out about him next week in the first part of Che, and then the week after we will check out the second part of. Che. che. It would be weird if we split them up. <laughs> we'll talk about, because um, I feel like, the, the, yeah, I just don't, I don't want to, see, the, I don't, you guys don't need to hear all this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, the, the danger, I thought, was like, I don't want to repeat ourselves. So if we're doing them back to back, it'll be easier for us to remember what we talked about in the last one. And, you know, like I said, if, they, if we get a shorter par- episode about part two, so be it. But we are going to talk about Che, of course, played by the wonderful Benicio del Toro, um, and also starring uh, Damian Bashir. So we'll 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 get on that. We'll get on that next week. But Jason, until then, they can find us all over the place. We're on all the social medias. We're on Facebook. We're our home base is Age of Radio. You go to ageofradio.org slash for screen. And Gundre. And that'll have all the links to all our uh, podcast. Uh, to all the podcast apps that we're on. But if you just want to look us up on any podcast app, you know, your your Googles and your your pod knives and whatnot, you could just search for us. Just type in your search browser for screen. And good dress. We're also on Twitter and Blue Sky, or as uh, <laughs> Steve uh, said, and I'm not sure if he was joking or if he actually thought it was pronounced like this, Blue Ski. Um, <laughs> You can find us on Yo. Twitter and Blue Sky and uh, it, at uh, FSAC Pod, as in for screen. And good oh, gosh. Jason, what about you? Are you on Blue Ski? I'm on Blue Ski, baby. Come on over and have a couple of Blue Skis with me on Blue Ski at uh, Jason D. McLeod. That's M A C O M A C. I know how to spell my name. M A C L E O D. Jason McLeod. And I'm also on the tweets. Yes. And I it's still tweets. It always is tweets. It's the tweets. It's tweets. We just ignore the crazy billionaire that shit posts there regularly. Already muted him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, day one, my friend. Um, but uh, that's 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 uh, that's pretty much it. So I guess uh, I guess I'll just say to you, Jason, to you in particular, I will mm-hmm. say to you as we get ready to talk about Shay Part One next week. God save the king. Do you think Che liked chicken wings? Ooh, we can ask him next week. Sweet. Uh, for Screening Country, I'm Brendan. And I'm Jason. Che, chicken wings? <laughs> ah, capitalism. He hated it. Mm. It's like, I just love a cowboy. No, I'm just like, I, I know it's bad, but I'm just like. For Screen and Country was created by and stars Brendan Wall and Jason McLeod. Today's film was Sands of Iwo Jima, released in 1949. The Marine Corps hymn and the You Go Boy remix of Lady Gaga's John Wayne served as our music today. This has been an Age of Radio production, copyright 2024.